Hi, I'm Therese Liljeblad and I work as a requirement manager for chemicals at IKEA of Sweden, IKEA Range and Supply. IKEA of Sweden is the IKEA unit where we develop the global IKEA product range. And that's also where we steer and plan the supply of it. Today, I will tell you a bit about our work on chemicals and more specifically, how we work with substituting and phasing out harmful chemicals in our products. Before that, I will just give you some facts and figures about IKEA. Today, we have around 211,000 co-workers around the world with 433 stores in more than 50 markets. And we have around 9,500 products in our product range, which are being produced by our approximately 1,000 suppliers. Our top purchasing uh, countries are China, Poland, Italy, and Sweden. The vision of IKEA is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And that includes, of course, to develop products with care for people and the planet. Our business idea is to offer a wide range of well-designed functional home furnishing products at prices so low that as many people as possible will be able to afford them. And that phrase captures the essence of IKEA it also captures our never-ending desire to improve all aspects of our product offer. This symbol describes our backbone, what we call democratic design. And that is our view on how to create products that are worthy of the IKEA brand and worthy of the many people. Democratic design is a method we use to develop products that have a beautiful design good function, are sustainable, of good quality, and are available at a low price. And all these aspects are of equal importance. Democratic design helps us fulfill our business idea and bring the IKEA vision to life. At IKEA, we stand by our customers, and we truly believe that all people have the right to safe and healthy products that are free from harmful chemicals. And chemicals are, of course, in many cases essential, and it gives us the opportunity to produce the materials in the IKEA products. They provide beautiful colors, for example, through dyeing and printing. They give texture to materials. Glues keep our products together, paints and other coating products. They protect material from uh, scratches, corrosion, and liquids. And many chemicals are, of course, safe and useful, but others are harmful. And this is why we need to use chemicals in a responsible way. Since uh, 2016, we had a chemical strategy within IKEA, and it's a sub-strategy to our sustainability strategy. Our work on chemicals aims at avoiding any harmful effects to health and the environment throughout the whole life cycle. That includes both the production of raw material, during the production process of final material and final products, during transport and distribution, during use of the products, and also during end of life of the products. We have identified five overall strategic objectives that we believe will enable us to continue to provide our customers with safe and healthy products from a chemical perspective. The first one is about an increased transparency on our chemicals in our products, both in our supply chain and also towards our customers. Number two is about doing risk assessment on all materials used. Number three is about phasing out or substituting harmful substances and materials. Number four is about 
our suppliers actually sharing our values on chemical safety and compliance. And last but not least, uh, to increase awareness about uh, among both co-workers, consumers and other key stakeholders about our work on chemicals. So how do we do it more specifically then? Well, as many other companies, we work with restricted substance lists that can be found among other information in our so-called specifications, which is the legally binding contract between IKEA and our suppliers. And the basis for our requirements are both regulations from various parts of the world it comes from standards, but also scientific facts of different kind, uh, as well as customer expectations. And when developing our requirements, we take into consideration both customer health and safety, but also the working environment, as well as the outside environment. And we're always aiming at applying the so-called class approach, meaning that we try to ban whole groups of chemicals instead of only banning single substances, as we truly believe that it's a good way to prevent uh, regretful substitutions. When it comes to our chemical requirements, we have a basic chemical requirement document, which is valid for as good as all IKEA products. In this document, we have our, our basic general ban on carcinogenic, methogenic and reprotoxic chemicals, category 1A or 1B, and also on substances of very high concern, SEHCs. And we do have some exceptions to the SEHC ban mainly in electrical components, and that is due to the listing of metallic lead as an SCHC back in 2018. When it comes to SCHCs and the SCIP database reportings, I would first of all like to highlight the main objective of the reportings. And that is, of course, to push for substitution of known problematic substances. For that reason, the first option shall always be to try to phase out or substitute the substance whenever possible. By doing that, also the administrational burden will be reduced. Also, by phasing out problematic substances, we will all contribute to more safe and healthy products for people and the planet. We will reduce the circulation of toxic materials and therefore enable a sustainable circular economy. For IKEA, SVHCs in electronics is already a so-called reportable substance and is today declared in our supply chain in dead PDF files. It's called Restricted Substance Statement of Compliance Documents. And it re would require quite some administration and work to transfer this data manually. And this is why we are now implementing boom check um, to the affected suppliers for SDHCs and other potentially substances of concern. And boom check includes a system to system integration to the SIP database submission portal. And thereby, we hope to minimize the administration and the burden for us and for our supply chain. Also companies like IKEA that want to be proactive when it comes to removing harmful chemicals are sometimes finding it very challenging from a regulatory perspective. The main challenges are related to different approaches to how markets define and regulate hazardous chemicals, sometimes related to unrealistic uh, traceability, and also policies that lead to regrettable substitution, as well as various reporting schemes. Therefore, as policymakers move forward with uh, legislation to regulate future use of chemicals, we would like to encourage the following. First of all, uh, when facing out chemicals that could cause harm, 
IKEA urges the use of chemical class approach. This means phasing out not only individual substances, but also whole groups of substances, which are proven or sometimes only suspected to have similar properties and therefore potential harm. This approach is adopted in order to the reduce of so-called regrettable substitution, where the replacement to the restricted substance is a similar chemical with similar harmful properties. So we encourage policymakers to find ways to support manufacturers with alternative approaches for those substances that cannot easily be replaced. And today, chemicals are regulated in various pieces of legislation on top of the general restriction, including, for example, the extended producer responsibility schemes, chemical taxes and labeling, and so forth. Often, each with its own list of hazardous chemicals and reporting requirements. A streamlined approach will simplify the process for regulators manufacturers and consumers, reduce costs uh, across the supply chain and provide more legal clarity to manufacturers and offer all consumers the same level of health and safety. In addition to the streamlining chemical legislations, we encourage policymakers to complement other important policy initiatives related to circularity and climate. As we move towards circular business models, we can't afford to work in silos. We need to find solutions that balance the interests of both people and planets. Now we will talk a bit about how we secure our supply chain, as it's a very important part in securing that our products are safe and healthy to use. And a banned substance appearing in final products can come from far back in the supply chain. It can be as a result of intentional use, but it can also be formed as a side reaction during the manufacturing process. Or it can come from contamination from another source. Therefore, it's important to work on improving the way we secure chemical compliance in the supply chain covering these kind of sources through supply chain communication and process control. And it all starts with understanding the importance of chemical compliance and risks in the material in the article. As I mentioned before, our documents containing the chemical requirements is a part of the legally binding contract between IKEA and our suppliers. We then require our suppliers, with help from our chemical experts within purchasing, to identify the chemical requirements from them, as well as the relevant verification methods, which, for example, could be through a test report or a so-called self-declaration. We also require them to communicate the requirements down their supply chain, and this has shown to be a key factor for success. We also require them to secure process control in production, as well as evaluating their sub suppliers and materials. When it comes to testing, we do it both during product development, before first delivery and then continuously, but also in case of audits, in case of spot checks and after claims. And to do today, the testing is done at internal laboratories and at um, third party laboratories. Today, we use around 80 external laboratories around the world. We also do quality assurances of many of our laboratories by doing inter laboratory trials where we compare the test results between the different laboratories. We also do visits to many of the laboratories. Now I will talk a bit about substitution of harmful chemicals. And when we identify and prioritize substances for phase out or substitution, we first of all look at their hazard, 
both for health and the environment. But we do also look into the exposure potential or the risk of that substance. For example, is it a substance that is well bond to the material and for that reason do not migrate? Or is it not that well bond, meaning that it could leak out from the material and result in an exposure to consumers? We also look at the impact, meaning is it a high volume substance in a high volume material and a high volume product, or is it not? Sometimes we find it a bit challenging to prioritize. And for that reason, we are now looking into a scoring system uh, to support ourselves in that work. When we want to phase out a certain substance or a group of substances, we ask ourselves a number of questions. First of all, is the substance really needed? And is the property that the substance provides, is it really essential or not? If the answer is yes, we ask ourselves, are there any alternative materials that do not require a particular chemical treatment? And if the answer is no, we continue and ask ourselves, are there any alternative uh, substances? And if so, what data is available about those? And are they really more safe or not? And if it appears that there are yet no safe uh, alternatives, we sometimes have to ask ourselves, is it really worth continuing to use a particular substance or not? ban on the whole class of PFAS in textile, paper and chemical products where we see the main risks. For textiles, we ban the whole group of PFAS since 2015. Already back in 2009, we banned PFOA, PFOS and PFOSA and their derivatives in textile. In 2015, we then took the decision to phase out the remaining use of PFAS from our textiles. And at that time, it was used uh, on microfabrics and on a tablecloth. And here we couldn't find a good alternative. Uh, so we simply took the decision to completely remove these products from our product range. And here we didn't think that it was worth continuing to use these chemicals. And we took that decision, even if it was a quite lucrative business uh, for us. Another example of where we use the class approach is for phthalates, where we have banned the whole group of phthalates in children's products since 2006 and in food contact products since 2009. For the rest of the product range, we ban, for example, all phthalates classified uh, as CMRs, category 1A or 1B, phthalates that are SDHCs, and also phthalates that are listed on the California Proposition 65 list. Here we also require information about alternative plasticizers that are added. And then we do an assessment on those before they are allowed to be used. And last but not least, uh, as our uh, founder Ingvar Kamplad once said, most things still remain to be done. What a glorious future. Thanks.